Welcome to Metabolic Matters Podcast, where we embark on conversations with thought leaders, disruptors, change agents, and passionate souls. Together, we'll delve into what truly matters to them. And you'll learn how to metabolize this newfound wisdom so you can transform your own metabolic health. Now let's meet today's guest. Wow. Wow. And wow. I mean, what an honor. Um, I've, Dr. Georgia Eid, I have told you this to your face before, but I feel like it's worth repeating to our listeners. I can try to remember the first time I hopped on the Georgia bandwagon and it was you being you and being a living laboratory, <laughs> a very public living laboratory in your own self-exploration to find your own way of healing for yourself. And you allowed all of us from the comforts of our own home to follow along on your journey. And so I am super excited, first of all, for just your willingness to be so vulnerable in that time, teaching all of us in that time, and honest to God, breaking a path into what is an emerging field known as you know, separate. I mean, you were doing this for other health areas, but your work also weaves into, which we're going to dive in deep to today, into an emerging field known as metabolic psychiatry, and for you where it started out as nutritional psychiatry. But I don't know, you, 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 you just astonish me at who you are, the humbleness of your being, the willingness to share your own exploration, and then to apply it to the masses and teach us how to do the same. So welcome, welcome, welcome. We may have a few things in common in that regard, Nisha. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I really, really appreciate this very kind introduction. And it's just an honor for me to, to be invited by you to, to talk with you and your followers. Thank you very, very much. Especially it's an important topic, mental health, important topic. So I appreciate it. I love it. And so, you know, one of the things that's so interesting, it actually hits you in the face, like a kind of a wet sock in the face in the first few lines of the first chapter of your book, you know, Change Your Diet, Change Your Mind, which I love is behind you on the shelf there. But I know the stats are bad, but to see them in writing and to understand the levity of it, you speak to the sheer statistics that there are 1 billion, with a B, people worldwide living with mental health disorders. And that doesn't even include, as you say, like lack of joy and sort of flat affect and just stress. Like that doesn't even include that population, which is probably another 2 billion on top of that. But you also speak to the fact that it's so bad that over 700,000 people take their lives because of this condition annually. And so it's clear to me that what we are currently doing is not working. And so I want to understand how your personal journey took you from sort of the, the walls of, of um, Harvard for crying out loud, as a psychiatrist in very conservative psychiatric environments to your own personal healing journey into understanding and applying this to the metabolic psychiatry field. Walk us through what this has been like for you. Well, sure. I, you know, like most psychiatrists, I was not taught about the relationship between food and the brain. I wasn't taught it uh, as an undergraduate in college. I wasn't taught it in four years of medical school. I, we didn't, and, and four years of psychiatry residency training, we oh. never talked about food. And so um, it really didn't cross my mind that food mattered to mental health or that I could use dietary strategies to heal people with even sometimes very serious mental health issues. Uh, and really, I, if you had told me, I, I, I wrote this in the book, if you had told me that I would be practicing this way, when I was in medical school, I would have looked at you as if you'd had three heads. I mean, I, I just didn't think nutrition mattered, except as a way to control my weight. You know, like most women who um, have a weight problem, I've always had a weight problem ever since I was young. And that's how I thought about food. I didn't think about food as a source of vital nutrients and uh, molecules and energy for the brain. And the other thing is that, you know, when we were in medical school and residency, we talked all these chemical imbalances, you know, what causes mental health issues well, 
it's chemical imbalances or it's genetics or it's uh, childhood trauma. Uh, so, you know, you, you treat the stress and the trauma and all of those issues with uh, those are the psychosocial roots of mental health issues. You treat those with psychotherapy. And then there are these biological root causes, these chemical imbalances. You treat those uh, with, with medication. Mm. And so psychotherapy and medication have been the mainstays of psychiatric care for uh, 75 years when it, uh, or more. So really nothing much has changed. Uh, and when I was working in, in, in private practice and in hospitals and in clinic settings and in universities, those were the tools that I had at my disposal. But when people would ask me, you know, why, you know, why am I depressed? Why do I hear voices? Why do I want to kill myself when everything around me is going well? Mm -hmm. Now, of course, for a lot of folks, things weren't going well. And so it was easy for them to say, oh, I must be depressed because of this or that. They could point to a reason that made sense. But I had some people in my practice who their lives were just looked fan they did excellent uh, you know, home life, uh, excellent childhood. They're making good money. They were happy in their work. They were physically fit. I mean, people who had no ostensible reason to be distressed, uh, mm -hmm. to have poor mental health. So when they would ask me, well, why? I don't understand this. I would come up with some sort of chemical imbalance response that I didn't even fully understand myself. And then I would, and, and I have no way to measure for I can't measure your brain chemicals in any direct way, in any reliable way, and tell you what chemicals might be unbalanced. So it was really just trial and error, uh, prescribing of medications. Let's try this one. Oh, well, you're depressed. Let's try another antidepressant. That one didn't work. Now let's try maybe a mood stabilizing antidepressant. Oh, that's not helping them. Let's think, let's try an antipsychotic uh, and maybe a stimulant. So there are all these different options but really no guidance and no biological understanding of how to use these medications because we really, we really didn't, we weren't really weren't taught what the biological roots of, of psychiatric disorders are. And to be fair, it's hard to figure out. The brain is hard to study. It's complicated. But I, I first became interested in nutrition to circle back to your question. When I, came across some of my own health issues, physical health issues in my early 40s, which I think a lot of middle-aged women will identify with and a lot of my patients were dealing with. And I had no idea how to help, how to help them with these things. Migraines, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, IBS. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, this is, you know, despite eating a low-fat, high-fiber, uh, calorie-controlled diet, running four times a week, um, doing uh, strength training on alternate days, uh, and I was doing everything I thought I could do for my health, but yet it wasn't improving. You know, I was going downhill. So mm -hmm. it's when I turned my own diet upside down through trial and error dietary approaches that I, I started to see, connect the dots. Because not only did my physical health improve in every way, but my mental health improved too. Incredible. Incredible. And I think this is true for a lot of people. They may not, you may not think you have a mental health issue. <laughs> I didn't think I had a mental health issue until it got better. Hmm. It's like, wow, my concentration's better. My energy's better. My mood is better. My mental stamina is better. My mental clarity. Amazing. I never thought that those things were, you know, that I was having any issues with any of those things. So hmm. I thought, you know, this diet seems to be good for the brain. Hmm. And I need to learn more about this because I've got lots and lots of patients who aren't getting better. Wow. You know, and I, I mean, remembering at the time when you were writing about your journey, this was still, it feels like a few years out from when we started to understand, I mean, our discussion of brain disorders of mental illness as a metabolic disease is relatively new. Yes. When you started this journey, was that even on your mind? Was that on your radar at that time? And when did you make that connection? We weren't taught about brain metabolism. We weren't taught oh, about what the, we were just weren't taught about how the brain gets energy, what its energy sources are, what its favorite energy sources are, how it switches back and forth, you know, between different ratios of different fuels. We we weren't taught about um, you know any other neurotransmitters in the brain other than the ones that we have medications to address. Uh, we weren't taught about brain structure. 
uh, and or development in psychiatry, four years of psychiatry residency. Most of what in, in psychiatry residency, most of what we ta were taught was how to prescribe medications, how to hospitalize people, um, how to you know assess people for risk and try to keep them safe, and and how to do psychotherapy. Now, hmm. all of those skills are valuable, and I still use all of those aspects of my training and my work, but they've become a very small part of what I do Same. because the lion's share of what I do now is improve people's brain health because that's the foundation of good mental health. So brain, as you're, you were asking, we, brain metabolism, we learned nothing about brain metabolism. And it's interesting because what I think I hear you say is that, you know, now you, it's not that you have just thrown out the baby with the bathwater of the psychosocial approaches to, to mental health. Those are still tools in your toolbox, but they are taking a back seat because you have another tool that seems to be more valuable, more effective, which also means you need to lean on those other tools far less. Am I, am I understanding that? That's exactly right, Nisha. So, uh, you know, I, I use a food first, I use a food first philosophy in my practice whenever feasible. So of course, in a crisis situation, an emergency, certain types of situations, working on diet first is not the right strategy. Uh, you, you know, you need first safety first, you need to stabilize the situation, and help, you know, uh, address whatever is most pressing at the moment. But the vast majority of what I do is help people who are interested in uh, in a food first approach to, to mental health issues of all kinds. I love this. And so, you know, what's interesting also the last five or six years is, I mean, I could go to a conference five years ago and talk about metabolic health and people looked at me like I had four eyes and, you know, which I do right now with my glasses, but <laughs> Me different back then. They were like googly eyes. So, but that was something that even then was a far stretch, especially trying to talk about metabolic impact with cancer. I think that, I mean, now I think you're the one facing the more uphill battle of trying to help people understand that despite all the metabolic mayhem plaguing the vast majority of adults on the planet and, and children as well, um, I think people can like get their mind around obesity, diabetes, maybe cancer maybe cardiovascular disease as a metabolic disease, but I think it's a new stretch for folks. It might be a surprise for them to hear today that metabolic health is also very integral to brain health, both in things like neurological disorders, um, you know, Alzheimer's, et cetera, but also mental health. And so can you speak to the role of what you understand and what your book dives in very deep on the role of insulin resistance in mental illness, in mental health and mental illness? Yes, you know what I when I heard you last speak at, at Keto Live in, in in Switzerland, you used this term. You 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 described metabolic health or uh, as sort of the soil. Mm -hmm. uh, you know that, and and this is that this is your environment. This is the environment that your cells are 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 living in, mm -hmm. and so I think that's a really apt analogy. So yes, of course, metabolism uh, doesn't just affect the body; it also affects the brain. As I like to say, studies have conclusively shown that the brain is part of the body. And so, you know, anything, anything that affects the body in a negative way will also affect the brain because the yeah. brain is connected to the body. So, um, and, and for so long, we've thought of the brain as separate and for, for a lot of interesting reasons, but you know, uh, it, th that time has, that time has passed. We now, we now understand so much more than we did even 10, 15 years ago about how, uh, metabolic health affects mental health about how nutrition affects affects mental health. The science is really exploding in these areas and we've got, you know, a small but growing number of us psychiatrists sort of on that leading edge studying, you know, passionate about this, you know, starting new centers at Stanford and Harvard University, doing new research studies around the world like like Dr. Ian Campbell in in, in Edinburgh. I mean, they're just this is a really really exciting time to be a psychiatrist because we have the information now available to understand at a level that we did not have before. Mm -hmm. And so in, to answer your question, the simplest way to think about insulin resistance and how it affects the brain is that probably most of your listeners already know, already know what insulin resistance is. But you know, if your insulin levels are running too high too often, which is our modern lifestyle, our modern lifestyle is a high insulin lifestyle, 
uh, then that bombarding your bloodstream and the, the surface of your blood-brain barrier, which is supposed to protect your brain from your brain's blood supply from potentially risky substances that are in the, the, the general circulation. If you're flooding uh, the surface of the blood-brain barrier in your circulation with too much insulin too often, if your insulin levels are running too high too often, then that's going to uh, gradually lead to greater and greater insulin resistance at the blood-brain barrier, which means that it's going to become harder and harder for insulin to cross into the brain. Wow. And every cell in the brain has an insulin receptor for good reason. Uh, insulin isn't just a blood sugar regulator. Insulin is a master regulatory hormone, a master growth hormone, a metabolic uh, uh, maestro, <laughs> and it is telling all of those cells what to do with the energy that's coming in. Mm. And if there isn't enough insulin coming into the brain, the cells will not be able to process glucose uh, properly or to full capacity. Uh, and so what you have in a nutshell is as, you're, as insulin resistance is progressing, you, your brain can be swimming in a sea of glucose, which still has really no problem waltzing into the brain, uh, even if you have severe metabolic damage, even type 2 diabetes, uh, glucose still waltzes in, no questions asked, but insulin will have a harder and harder time crossing in. So now you've got a brain swimming in a sea of glucose, but still slowly starving to death. Wow. And I've seen, of course, in that swimming pool of glucose that you describe, it actually changes the structure of the brain. It shrinks element parts of the brain. And it the way we look at, um, at glucose in circulation outside of the brain, we know it creates these um, glycosylated end products, which I like to describe as basically sort of rusting of the tissues of the body, which I imagine is going to hold the same type of response in the brain as well. Is there, am I accurate in what, I mean, because I just don't know this part of the, of the equation as well, but those are what we see distant. And so I'm curious if that relates to what you're seeing in the brain too. Yes. So these advanced glycation end products, uh, really it's just, you know, every time you get a blood sugar spike, you get a brain sugar spike. Yeah. Oof. And so you get this brain sugar spike and the brain is very sensitive to glucose. It really does not want to have a lot of glucose available. It, the blood brain barrier generally keeps your brain glucose level about 80% lower than your blood glucose level to protect it from you know too much glucose, the effects of too much glucose. Mm -hmm. So if your brain sugar is going up too high too often, every time that happens, you're creating these advanced glycation end products, that extra sugar is sticking. It's sticking to proteins and lipids and DNA and all yeah. these important molecules, kind of caramelizing them and crippling them yeah. into these clusters that then need to be cleaned away, uh, you know, uh, through a process of inflammation and oxidative stress. So every time you're, you're getting a blood sugar spike, you're getting a brain sugar spike, then you're getting a wave of inflammation, you're getting a wave of oxidative stress. Wow. If you're eating that way, like most people still are, unfortunately, three, four, five, six times a day, too many of the wrong carbohydrates too often, your brain will be in a constant state you know, chronic inflammation and oxidative stress, very damaging for the brain, disrupts neurotransmitter balance, um, damages the physical structures of the brain, the blood brain barrier, the hippocampus, um, everything that really nothing is left untouched. So it's a very, very serious situation that t is taking place quietly in the background for years and years without people really being aware of it. Right. Cause you can't like see it some people can feel it. They may not understand that that that's what they're feeling, like big mood changes or or sluggish thought processes. But for the most part, it's very insidious and quiet until it's sort of too late, until the damage is really done. So one of the things I think you spoke to a moment ago is just sort of this this uh, small group of you out there, this metabolic and nutritional psychiatry group of experts. I could probably count on both hands, <laughs> probably even one of how many experts there are. So you've already mentioned, you know, um, Dr. Ian Campbell in Scotland, obviously you, Dr. Chris Palmer, um, uh, his book, Brain Energy, this is like such a beautiful, like setting the stage for the terrain of the yes. brain, which you then build on in more detail, which we'll talk about here in a moment. Um, Dr. Shivani Sethi, one of those people that are, you talked about doing the research at Stanford, yes. um, our lovely friend, Ignacio down in South America. Um, he's, he's like the you of South America. You guys are BFFs now and have this beautiful relationship because he's also taking this into very academic and hospital environments of, of this. But 
really, that is off the top of my head. You guys are kind of the big players and that's it. And one of the things I think is exciting that you're doing, Georgia, is you have created and been maybe in conjunction with some of your colleagues, a, a training program for both prescribers and non-prescribers in the mental health space. Can you speak to a little bit about how are you going to start to get more than just a handful of you on board with the absolute need of this expertise in the field of mental health? Right. So you're right. There, there is just right now a, a small number of us, uh, including Dr. Palmer and Dr. and Dr. Sethi. Um, and but I want there to be more of us. Yes. So you know we need more. Uh, you know all of us. All of us have wait lists. All of us. You know we 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 need help, and we and patients need help. People need psychiatrists and uh, other types of mental health professionals that they can turn to when they want to use these strategies strategies such as ketogenic diets and other kinds of special diets uh, and, and other types of uh, ketogenic metabolic therapies to treat a mental health condition. And the, it, it's really important to, that you have to have a certain amount of knowledge and skill to be able to do this, not because the diet is dangerous um, not, and not because these therapies are dangerous, but because you, in order to navigate the, 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 the transition period to these diets, yes. you need to be able to monitor the medications carefully and any existing medical issues or mental health issues uh, during that transition phase as the body and the brain are seeking to find their new equilibrium. So that does take some specialized knowledge and skill, and uh, there just weren't enough of us doing this. And so to help meet the demand for these metabolic services and nutrition oriented services i created this this course and i'm you know i i i really am uh, uh very very uh overjoyed when i teach this course because i meet clinicians from all around the world all different types of backgrounds who are passionate about this and really want to bring these therapies to their to their patients and and we've also created a directory um completely free to, to search and to and to submit your listing to if you practice this way, specifically clinicians who specifically treat mental health conditions using ketogenic therapies. So that directory is also a, a, a way for people to find uh, support, clinical support, uh, if they're interested in using these strategies uh, for themselves. I love it. And talk about another parallel path. Because it's the same way in the metabolic oncology space. There was a handful of us there. And now um, because of exactly like, it feels like we have, we're drawn by the just demand, right? Yes. Doing something more where there comes a time when you just can't carry the load by yourself. And a couple of your colleagues can't either. And, you know, in our community at, to date, we're up to 200 clinicians in 36 countries, I, you know, starting two new cohorts a year. I really hope there's a way that we can uh, merge sort, you know, resources to spread out all things about metabolic health and help get more metabolic uh, mental health workers into your tract, as well as there's a lot of cross pollination between the oncology and the mental health space as well. So I love, I'm, it's del I'm delighted to see that you got this launch because you were talking about it last summer. I know it was close, so it's out there now. So we'll definitely put links to that. And then this book that explains the journey <laughs> through your personal process, through the journey of this sort of mismatch and misinformation and mythology around nutrition and whether it even has a role in mental health and its impact specifically in brain health is just incredible. What I was telling you before the recording, and I really wanted to highlight here for the listeners is I, I consider myself very savvy in nutrition, metabolic. this is like my world. That's the foundation for what we do as well. I was utterly blown away that if nothing else, if people just like you raised the cover of your book, didn't have a title to it, I would say that this is one of the best books in nutrition for metabolic health in general, period. Thank you. Thank you. I, I really appreciate that. And, and I worked very hard to include uh, uh, information about just basic information about food that most people don't know that I think is fascinating. <laughs> And, uh, you know, just every food group and how it works and what, you know, really, I, sometimes I think of myself as a food psychoanalyst, yeah. you know, kind of looking at food from food's point of view, <laughs> you know, <laughs> if you kind of look at the world from food's point of view, it all makes sense. 
I mean, if you put yourself in the position of, you know, a a stalk of broccoli or a lion or, you know, an egg, and you really understand your, (laughs) if you look at your, if you look at the world from the point of view of the the foods you want to eat, it all becomes very simple to understand uh, how that food is going to affect you. So it's a lot of fun. (laughs) You're like the modern version of what is that veggie tales? Remember that childhood TV show on Saturday morning? So now I'm excited to like go back and (laughs) think about this matches, but that's just it. I really want people to hear that, that this, whether you had good, good background in nutritional training or not, which most of you did not. Okay. Um, in most fields, I don't care who you are, what, what field you came from. This is a must read for just bringing yourself up to speed with regards to really good nutrition education, as well as metabolic nutrition education. So absolutely prime here. And I'm so happy to hear that that was your intention. So let's, let's take a little bit like why, like when you think about a brain healthy diet for you and all that you've learned so far, because I recognize we're all constantly in this learning together. What is the foundation of a brain healthy diet? So a brain healthy diet needs to do three things. It needs to nourish the brain by providing all essential nutrients. So you need to know where those nutrients are, which foods contain those nutrients, and and whether or not those nutrients are accessible to you. Mm. Because just because a food contains a nutrient does not necessarily mean that you can access it. Yes. So that's a, a little known secret in nutrition science. So you must nourish the brain with essential nutrients. You must protect the brain from damaging ingredients, all the modern processed foods, the refined carbohydrates, the vegetable oils, all the additives protect the brain and you need to energize the brain. Uh, and, and in order to energize the brain safely throughout the lifespan to protect it, the, the healthy metabolism, brain health, uh, to protect healthy brain metabolism, yeah, you need to keep your glucose and insulin levels in a healthy range. And for some people, uh, depending on how much metabolic damage there is, depending on what condition you are dealing with, you may need that, that may mean a ketogenic diet. And uh, so I walk people through in the, in the book, these different steps they can take uh, to work their way through uh, yeah. different plans to find, okay, what, do you, what will work best for you? So just having the basic understanding about the nutrients, the dangers of you know, the, the, the dangerous ingredients. So eat the nutritious foods, take the bad foods out mm-hmm. and keep an eye on your glucose and insulin levels. Really, that's all there is to it. <laughs> Gorgeous. Uh, that's all there is to it. And you give us such a tangible, what I love is, um, I think folks meet you and I like years that into our journey. And I think they think we just woke up one day. I'm like, I'm a professional. I know exactly how to eat. My <laughs> out. Here's where you start. It doesn't work that way. It's trial and error. And we all need different things at different times. And so what I love about your last chapter of sort of like, what do you, how do you do this? You set up what you call your quiet diet roadmap. And what's really beautiful also about you and just your essence. And I think that it's well conveyed here. You are not dogmatic and you are not pushy. You are in, you are invitational in your delivery of this. Mm -hmm. And as such, you're saying, come along for a ride with me. And maybe here we'll stop at this bus stop and see if this quiet paleo is enough to move the dial. Not quite, not quite right. Okay. Well, let's go on to the next bus stop. Maybe you need to kick it up a notch to the next tier, which is the quiet keto, um, you know, diet. That's not quite enough. If you've got a lot of things going, which she goes into great detail what that means. So I want you to get curious and dig deeper as to why, who, when, and why might need to start at a paleo, a keto, or higher. Um, then you take them onto the bus stop for those who really are in need to the quiet carnivore bus stop. And I know that's where you have personally landed in your own overall health improvement, not just on the mind, but the body and spirit as well. Um, we won't go into details of what that is because I want people to get curious and learn about for them, right on precise for themselves. But what I really would love for you to talk about, and this is, this is always controversial in my world as well, but why might a plant-based diet be less helpful for our brain? Yeah. So uh, depending on what we mean by the term plant-based because it's a very slippery term. Uh, It means different things to different people. But if we're talking about a vegan diet or if we're talking about a near vegan diet, meaning too little animal foods, uh, even if it's a vegetarian diet, but maybe it doesn't have enough eggs or dairy in it, uh, without enough animal foods in the diet, you will not be able to properly nourish your brain cells or any other cells in your body. 
And it's a simple biological fact and it's, it's inconvenient and it's uncomfortable to think about. And it's very unpopular to, you know, to, to think this way. Uh, and you know, you can try, you can try to supplement your way around it. Um, uh, it, it might be, it might be something that works for you at least for a period of time, especially if you're very careful in how you construct your, the, your diet. If you make your diet, a, if you follow not just the plant-based, but the whole foods, mm -hmm. if you say whole foods, plant-based, right. whole foods, plant-based, properly supplemented may be safe right. for some people. Um, yeah. but, uh, only if supplemented properly, only if constructed of, you know, whole foods and, and not if you're pregnant or a growing child, right. there sure. just is, it's very dangerous. And I, I, I do, uh, make this clear because, you know, I'm, I like to say, and it's true. I'm nutritionally pro-choice. <laughs> I, will, I will support you and help you make any diet that, uh, that you feel comfortable eating right. healthier for your brain, for your metabolism. Um, you know, I, you know, I respect whatever choices people make. I just want people to have the right information so that they can make an informed choice yes. and decide what's most important to them. If they're willing to put up with some of the, the very real risks of undernourishing the brain, then that that's, that's their prerogative. That's perfectly okay. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, there are there are some things, and I and I, I help people in the book with this. If you prefer mm -hmm. a vegetarian diet or a vegan diet, I give you some tips about how to make that those diets help you, healthier, right? Where you can't really um, justify recommending, I can't as a physician justify recommending or supporting a vegan diet is during pregnancy and the first uh, thousand. Oh. The first thousand days of life, and, and and even for growing children, I think it's very risky strategy. So yeah, I mean, I would like to say like one of the biggest mind boggling, jaw dropping conversations I ever heard was your presentation last year in Switzerland at the Keto Live Summit. Incredible, compelling data on the first thousand days. So I would love for you to highlight this because this is so critical because this is how we, we might have a hard time changing our own brain now, but we certainly have a huge role we can play in the developing brains of our future generations. Yes. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm just going to read a short, very short. Please, please. Uh, so there's the chapter called the plant-based brain going out on a limb. And, uh, and this is about, about the brain, about brain development and how the thing about brain development is that you get one shot at it yes. and the, every nutrient needs to be there in, in exactly the right amount at exactly the right time. And if it is, not, if it is five minutes late, if it is, if it is 5% less than you need five, the quantity is 5% less, something is not going to develop properly and you never get another chance to, 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 uh, to develop that part of the brain. It happens very, very fast. A lot of this happens before women even know they're pregnant. And so it's critical that women, uh, who are thinking about planning families or, or, or who may become pregnant, um, uh, that they know which foods and nutrients need to be there. Right. So just a little piece to give an example. Um, as the brain rounds the corner into the third trimester, it enters a marathon of intensive brain building that continues until age two. Brain cells busily multiply to form new structures, migrate to new destinations, and myelinate new axons to establish secure communication pathways. This whirlwind of activity requires membranes, lots and lots of membranes. To prepare for this long growth spurt, the brain begins hoarding massive quantities of DHA and choline to insert into the membranes of every new cell it creates. So this is just one tiny example of these two nutrients, DHA and choline, are very hard to find. I mean, they don't exist in plant foods. I mean, DHA does not exist in plant foods at all. Um, and, and, and choline is difficult to find in plant foods. So, so these are irreplaceable nutrients. As during this first uh, stage of life, when all of these windows are closing, mm. uh, the different, different stages of the development process, we need more DHA when we're, when we're building a baby's brain than we do when we're an adult. So, and DHA only comes from animal foods. 
And if, and, and it does not come, it's an omega-3 fatty acid. It does not come from flax seeds. Plants contain the wrong form of omega-3. They contain ALA, not DHA. So lots and lots of issues. So I, I, I walk people through it because I want people to have an image in their minds of what's not happening properly if they're not eating properly. Man. And knowing that we have a billion on our planet dealing with mental health and the mental health crisis is not slowing down. It's only growing. If we know this information, we can start the next generation off on the right foot. So I think that's really huge. The other big truth bomb you land in this book is about sort of the mythologies around superfoods. I love this so much because I too have fallen victim to the super food beliefs over my entire career, over my own thing. Like a little bit's good, so much more is better. This is what everyone needs to be eating all the time. And a little bit of this, like so many things like cassava, for instance, which great when I got rid of all the grains, I loaded up on cassava and I was having all these symptoms. Like I was still, because I've got celiac disease, I was still having symptoms like mm. I had celiac disease, did some functional testing and realized, wow, my body thinks every time I eat cassava, that I'm actually taking in gluten. And what's even more, which I did not know until I read your book, cassava is actually quite high in cyanide as are flax seeds. Not to say that you'll get cyanide poisoning, but you're adding this extra hormetic stress into the system of something if you're eating it often enough, which a lot of us in the going grain-free world really supplement hard with things like cassava and flax as our non-grain sources to augment like fine bread and another version. Amazing information here. And I, this quote is what rounds it out. So when I think about all the cauliflower rice, when I think about all the almond, everything, almond pancakes, almond cookies, almond breads, when I think about the cassava and flax craze, this quote totally rocked my world. This is Dr. Georgia Eid. Placing your faith in superfood myths may only serve to enable you to continue eating and drinking things that are working against you. So that's that place too. We have to let go of our expectations and our dogma and what we want to be true and let the data of our own biology tell us a different story and guide us very intuitively as well as very specifically to what is right or wrong for us. Would you add anything else to this piece? Well, I would just say how much I appreciate um the, the your your take on it your summary of it because you can hear in your own background and in the passage the passage that you chose is and I, I I'd like to think that that some of us who have moved into this nutrition world share this this trait of being open minded and curious staying open minded staying curious I don't know everything I'm learning all the time if I learn that something that I've advised somebody to do turns out to be the wrong thing. I am going to be the first one to say, I, I learned something new. And uh, so, and I think this is really a, a beautiful, um, a, a beautiful example. And, you know, because people who are very attached to certain foods that they, they believe are really good for them. Um, it, it requires a little mental flexibility to step away from some of those habits and say, oh, you know, I didn't know that about this food. Uh, this food probably isn't very good for me. And, and, and then it takes a lot of strength to make a change. So this mm -hmm. is, I've tried to word things as gently as I can so that it, so that people can take the information in, um, and, and hopefully do something with it that will help them feel better. Oh my gosh, Georgia, I tell you this book, it is, it is a, it is a gold mine. It, I feel like this should be required reading for all the doctors in my, in my training program, because it helps us understand just even the psychology of our patients, but also what may be contributing to the psychology of our patients that we're trying to help in the oncology space and beyond. Um, it's a great resource. It's a great reference. If people are like, I really want to understand like the, I mean, you just go into the, you just go, it is a textbook. As I said, you've got all of these great resources. So I see that here but where I want you to to take us just on your final thoughts is what are you most hopeful about and excited about in the future of this field? What can we all be looking for and how can we help make it so? What I'm really excited about, and it's already started to happen, uh, but it, it, it's, it, it's just, it, it's, a, it's a very fragile new beginning. But uh, what I really hope is that every person with a mental health condition walks in for an evaluation. And as part of that evaluation, 
regardless of the symptom, regardless of the, uh, of the potential diagnosis, um, regardless of the condition, that everybody with a mental health condition gets a metabolic evaluation. That's, uh, that needs to be uh, a cornerstone of, of, of what we do with all of our patients, every single one. Uh, we all need to have a little bit of metabolic literacy to be able to do that yes. and, and then offer people choices. One of the reasons I wrote this book is I was just becoming tired of listening to people tell me these stories about how they yeah. accidentally stumbled into the ketogenic diet for mental health exactly. after you know going through all kinds of other atrocious treatments that weren't working. I'm just tired of people um, ac having to accidentally stumble into these things. We need to let people know that these, this is an option for most people from day one, if they choose to explore it. Mm -hmm. And I think that this, I think so many people could avoid so much heartache, mm -hmm. perhaps hospitalizations, perhaps injuries, perhaps suicide. Um, these, these interventions and these principles are very powerful. And I, I want as many people to have these tools at their fingertips as, 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 as we can find. Oh my gosh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so excited that this is your book has been birthed into the world just in the last week. And yeah. I feel very honored to have gotten an early read and to have you here so early on to share this world. Um, this new world emerging in the field of metabolics and nutritional psychiatry. So where can folks find this gem and how can they learn more about you and your training offerings? Yeah. So um, I have a website called diagnosis diet dot com and the book is available on the website you know it'll, it'll show you the links to you know to buy from your favorite bookseller wherever you choose to buy it or you can ask your local library to to stock it for the community um and uh th there's also information on that same website about the clinician training uh, program there's a tab for clinician training and there's a tab for the clinician directory so if you're looking for services or looking for information um, or looking for the book, it's all there on the same, on the same website. Amazing. I wish you nothing but a hugely successful book launch. I already know it's being so well received. I can't wait to see the ripple effect it has in the world around us and in the minds and hearts of many. So Dr. Reed, thank you for, for, for being you. Thank you so much. I've really, really appreciated uh, the opportunity to talk with you about this. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Metabolic Matters. We hope you found today's conversation insightful and empowering. As we wrap up today's episode, we want to take a moment to acknowledge the incredible team and supporters who make this podcast possible. First, we'd like to thank our production team, Alex Sanchez, Cindy Kennedy, Jessica Gilman, and Lynn Hughes for their hard work behind the scenes. Our theme song was written by Julie Newmark and performed by Whiskey Flower. And finally, we want to thank you, our listeners, for tuning in and being a part of the Metabolic Matters community. Do you want to learn more? Please visit our website, metabolicmatters.org, and you can follow us on Instagram. If you liked this episode, please leave us a review and share it with your friends and family. And if you want to help support our mission, spreading awareness and knowledge about metabolic health, reach out. We'd love you to join with us. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell to stay updated on upcoming episodes. We have so much exciting content coming your way. Until next time, stay curious, stay empowered, and remember, your metabolic health matters.